Hey, welcome to the Hypothesis Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Martinez. Today we have returning guests, Mark Del Priori and Mitchell Kidda. If you haven't seen the episode, please go check it out. We talk about land entitlements, pretty much A to Z process, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But today we cover deal breakdown. We cover cool, interesting stories. I think uh, Mitchell's going to lead on this one. And then I have a little bit on that bet. But go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, so do you want me to just dive right into the yeah, breakdown or do we yeah, just dive right into the breakdown, whatever you want to share? Right. So, okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty of the land entitlement space, right? Where everything is, it's a very extremely political environment that no one really talks about, right? You need your key consultants in these specific jurisdictions that have a lot of pull in these various markets and have relationships established with planning and zoning officers, um, mayors, anybody, city council, people in the that jurisdiction that has political pull to get your projects approved or not, right? Yeah. And when you're picking your consultants, your civil engineer, your land use attorney, you want to make sure and vet them to a high extent, making sure you're calling around, seeing who else has used them, other developers that have been using them to get their projects approved, right? Or get their projects rezoned with a land use attorney. What success? A good way to do that is when you're going through your, your city or county's uh, municipal website, you can see typically what permits are being pulled in those sites or what or what um site plans are being submitted to the city right you can see on you can open up it's all public information you can open up those documents and in the bottom right corner you'll see the little sigil of what either civil engineer or architectural firm and whatever ones that you keep seeing pop up over and over again are the ones that you're going to want to reach out to because obviously if, if all these other various developers or builders are using these companies they're having good success with them so that's how you find your good consultants um in that various jurisdiction, right? Because you want to build a very um, niche group in that specific market where you're doing projects. And that's what we learned the hard way, right? Is is we were blindly trusting civil engineers um, and it ended up biting us in the in the back, right? Okay. Um, how, do, how do you prevent how do you and prevent hold people accountable on timelines? So by holding people accountable on timelines is they have to have, you have, because in your contract, right, when you're under contract with a part, property, right, we have a set amount of time frame for yep. our due diligence or feasibility period. We have to be up front. So say, for example, we have 120 days for a feasibility study for under a contract. You have to go to your engineer and they'll ha typically have a timeline or time frame of how long it'll take them to get a, a site plan drawn up or doing a phase one environmental or getting all the geotechnical studies done. Yep. And you really need to make sure that those timelines are hit and you got to be on them. It's just like any other subcontractor, right? If you're doing a fix and flip or if you're doing a, or if you're building a new construction home, you got to be on top of those subs, right? If you're not harping on them, they're not showing up, right? It's, it's the same type of thing when you're dealing with civil engineers or architectural engineers, they have multiple projects they're doing and you got to really be on top of them to make sure those timelines are being hit. And that's, pretty much what you need to be doing is making sure you're on top of them, making sure there's good communication, open communication, going back and forth. Hey, was this done? Was this completed? Um, where are we with this process? And always being on top of everything and having everything documented along the way. Because if you just blindly trust that they're doing these projects and meeting with these jurisdictions and you're out and you're in virtual markets, right? So, cause we can technically do this business anywhere. We yeah. can be completely virtual. Mm -hmm. So us, like myself, I'm in Fort Myers, Florida, and if we're doing a project in San Antonio, I'm not there. I, I can't confirm that these things are there. But now we have some various ways that we can do that by having maybe some people in our network that can go to the city council meeting, sit down, kind of see how it was in the background, see what it looked like. There's various things you can do outside the box type of things to make sure that those things are moving forward and happening. Because, again, if you just blindly trust someone um, and you're giving them draws and you're wiring them money. You got to make sure that those those they're being with they're being they're upholding their end of the contract right of their yeah. of their agreement that you sign with those various consultants. And I, I like the the contractor side of it because it's almost like the the scope of work and keeping track of the timelines. Right. And this is it's the same stuff. Um, I had an interesting story that came through my through my lead flow that uh, there was a, a group of people they bought like two hundred fifty acres outside of Dallas for three and a half million. And one of the people in their projects that was supposedly some of the partners ended up embezzling uh, over half a million dollars from the project. So yeah. it's it's a it's a big issue, and it happens on bigger projects because there's a lot more money at yeah. play. 
and it could be easily be done if you're not holding people accountable. So I think it's it's a hundred percent. I'm glad it's brought up here because this is one of the big things. Like this, as much as we talk about land entitlements and the upside, there's always drawbacks and downsides to what, everything that you do, and you have to understand and carry and weigh all those costs that come in. Because I mean, these are this is a lot of money switching hands. Right. Yeah, right. I wanted to also and, talk about like real quick. So cause I, I know we're short on time. One thing about land entitlements is. A, a positive side, even though there's a negative side, I'm going to give you yeah. a negative and a positive at the same time. Absolutely. So what happens is, is let's say we do 10 entitlement projects, okay? And let's say seven of them. We did feasibility studies. We spent five, ten, twenty thousand 20000 on each, and they didn't pencil, okay? Instead of us taking it all the way to civil and spending a lot more money and losing everything because the builder won't take it, we yeah. walked away after we, we after those seven or eight projects. We walked away and said, we're not going to do anything. But the two projects out of the 10, they worked out. And we did the feasibility study. We went to, we went to preliminary plat. We got everything done. We got it entitled. We sold it. The money we make on those two projects, even though we lost eight of them, yep. will substantially get all of our money back plus like 100x like almost. It's like, I may be exaggerating a little, but it's unfathomable that you can lose like you know 80% of the time in this game. And 20% of the time you can win and you can make significant ROIs and get all your money back at the same time. So you could still right. lose and win, you know, if you do it right, you know, so. I, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that. And that's a, that's hundred percent a fact. You don't have to, we don't have to hit every time, but as long as you understand the risk and the timelines, you don't need to home run every time you're going to, if you keep coming to bat, you're going to get a home run once and that's going to cover all the potential losses. And I'm really glad you mentioned that hundred percent fact. Um, there's a lot of um, – there's a lot of – and it's one of those things like if you bat once and lose once and you're out of the game, that's that's when you're going to lose. But I think if, if you keep keep coming up to bat, you're going to get better. Right. Exactly. It's, like, it's like baseball. If, you, if you're hitting 300 or if you're batting over 300, you're considered one of the best players in the MLB, right? Yeah. It, it's like – it's we don't want to do that. Like our goal is to not lose on the projects that we're prospecting. Like Absolutely. that's where a lot of where our team's experience comes in to where we can see those up. We can see that this property is not going to make sense before we even, even bother. What's really good is the money that would be lost in that first half of the project wouldn't even be our PML's money because that comes on the back half. So we give them as minimal as risk as possible because we'll spend that money usually out of our own pockets, right, to make sure that the feasibilities work out. And then on the back half, the PMLs will come in and they're really insulated because we've done all that feasibility up front. So, yeah. Right. And that also shortens their time frame of being, being in the deal. We can we can, we can, can pretty much ax half of the entitlement process in half to where instead of having a private money lender come in and wait 12 to 18 months, they're in and only they're in and out within four to six months because we're doing most of the upfront legwork and then we're bringing them on the back end where it starts getting a lot more capital intensive, a lot more um, costs from the jurisdiction as far as um, permitting fees and things of that nature, and and that's how we kind of navigate that environment of bring, of how we're utilizing our private money partners now. Now it's going to change in the future because we are actively raising capital to be funded in house. Yeah. where that we won't be bringing in private money lenders anymore. Um, we'll be able to go from A to Z without having um, any issues as far as that goes. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing, man. This has been a good, a really good episode. I think everybody can learn from this one. And I think even if you're not in the land title game, I hope you can take that knowledge. Make sure you vet your partners, make sure you keep everybody accountable. Or you're doing a flip and you got a contractor working, keep everybody accountable. And if you got to get a good win, it's going to cover all your losses and just keep coming up to bat and keep playing the game. And you'll see the benefit in the long term. I think that's the general synopsis of this one. But I think I mean, this is a really good episode. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mitchell. Uh, where can people find you online really quick? Um, and then we'll end it here. What's that? Uh, where can people find you online? Oh, yeah. So, uh, again, LinkedIn, you know, Facebook. Uh, just Google. Just put my name in. Uh, if you Google my name, you'll see come up a lot of videos. Also, go to landentitlement.net. That's our website. Check us out there for more uh, dis description on what we're doing. Um, and then Facebook, LinkedIn. So yeah, there you go. And Mitchell, and then myself as well. I'm on Facebook and extremely active on LinkedIn as well. My LinkedIn account is the same as my name right there on the bottom left corner, Mitchell Kita. And then you'll be able to DM me, and I'll be able to get back with you in a couple hours or a day. Sounds good, man. For everybody here, go like, share, subscribe if you found if you found value today. 
Um, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for coming in, Mark Mitchell. We'll see you in the next episode. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you, buddy. Hey, if you have any deals you'd like to submit to the Hive Mind and our team, go to hivebc.io. It's actually the Hive Buyers Club. Submit your deals and we can hopefully dispel your deal for you. Have a great day.